Hello, this is Bob Brown with Community Coronavirus Update number 91. We'll talk about the need for data-driven policy, metrics for backing off, and when to make the right call on boosters. So, uh, starting off, you know, you can't really make good data-driven decisions without good data that's open and transparent and honest, actually. So, uh, Ted and I put together this uh, cumulative uh, death mortality rate for children for both coronavirus, which is the black line, and then all the last flu seasons. And so we started them at October uh, when a typical flu season would start and then stacked on the next year's uh, flu mortality. And you can see pretty quickly, uh, well, basically about a year into it, we knew that coronavirus was in fact worse than influenza in children. Uh, keep in mind that, that for the first three months, uh, everybody was at home. And the next year, every school was either at home or all wearing masks and still the numbers were, were worse. And now that we've sent too many kids back to school without masks, uh, mortality is going up pretty high. Uh, just the last uh, couple weeks of September, of September, we've added 46 more deaths. So if we run this uh, graph next month, uh, that coronavirus mortality will be well over 500. And so it's, it's get pretty clear that, that although it's not as bad coronavirus isn't as bad for kids as it is for adults. It is far worse than influenza, and so we need to be honest about that in the future, and we need politicians will be honest about that. Um, you know, thankfully, uh, we are bringing back the dashboard in Nebraska, and it's up and running, and I've put a link down in the notes section so you can go take a look at it yourself. So we need that kind of data to make good decisions, and so here it is. Uh, we've got vaccination rates, uh, mortality, active hospitalizations up to 448 now, uh, which is uh, unfortunately too high. Um, there is some uh, uh, county level data, although I'd be cautious about this. Our, our access to testing is so bad right now and the turnaround is so bad that these numbers are probably vast underestimates and, and not accurate uh, just because there's just not enough testing being done. So, you know, as far as policy making, you know, I'll use the example of when should the masks have been put on and when should we take them off again? And unfortunately, uh, these, these have not been data driven decisions in the past. Uh, these also need to be public decisions uh, that are transparent decisions that an expert can verify. And that's not happened uh, on either side of the fence, either Republican or Democrat, which is a, a very disconcerting to me. So I'll throw out some potential metrics, like when do I think uh, metrics sh we should back off on the mass here in Lincoln, for example, what criteria should we use? And the, I've run these by some uh, so the experts I trust the most. And so here's my my stab at it. Hopefully we'll have a public and, and uh, an informed discussion about this before we take our masks off in Lincoln. And hopefully some of the people who haven't put them on will put them on. So number one, hospitals have capacity for sick people, and this is a problem right now. Uh, here in Lincoln, uh, we, we're still at capacity for our hospitals. You'll notice the blue line, that is hospitalizations from people who live in Lincoln, Lancaster County. Those are dropping because we put our mask ordinance in place about a month ago. Uh, lag, hospitals are lagging indicator, so, so about two weeks later, uh, it leveled off and now we're dropping. Uh, now we're still at capacity because we're taking in so many people from surrounding areas and so the people not wearing masks are sending their hospitalized patients to us because they can't take care of them. So thankfully Lincoln is filling that gap. Uh, Omaha is already also at capacity. So if you look at their numbers there on the right, uh, that's about as many people as they can have. They can't ha house, ha take as many COVID hospitalizations as they could before because we're still filling the backlog in healthcare from last time. And so our hospitals are at capacity, plus we're having a hard time uh, getting enough nursing and, and, uh, and respiratory therapists that we just can't take anymore. Uh, and, and doctors and nurses and respiratory therapists, they're getting burnt out. And so we can't take masks off for a while because we need the hospitals to have a breather. Uh, there's a lot of good data. I think again, Brian Health putting out great visualizations, which others are now doing. Uh, North Platte Hospital doing the same thing. Uh, so it's good to see local healthcare providers like you know Russ Kroash and uh, Geneva putting out uh, this uh, ad in the paper and explanations. People trust their local doctors and nurses, and so it's great seeing uh, folks speaking up across the state, uh, trying to get people to do the right thing, put on a mask, and get vaccinated. Uh, reduced community spread is another criteria, and it needs to be low by CDC criteria, not a made-up criteria. And it won't be accurate until our test positivity is less than 5%. So our numbers really aren't that accurate right now, uh, but they're, they're actually probably worse than what, than what they look. Uh, here in Lincoln, it looks like our numbers uh, have been dropping for a little over two weeks now, again, because the mask ordinance was put in place. And so we have the right people masking and our rates are dropping. But we should have put in our mask on uh, when we started crossing this yellow into orange level instead of waiting to here. We waited too late, uh, but we shouldn't take them off until we get back into here again. Uh, I'll note that Douglas uh, County on its dashboard is also using the CDC criteria as one of its uh, risk criteria, and we should be following that. Uh, that is a mathematically driven, scientific driven uh, recommendation by the CDC, and I think that's a good one. Uh, again, you know, this data that from we could we can figure this, start figuring out this out for the rest of the state now. However, because of the low test positivity, it's probably not that accurate yet. 85% uh, community level and building level vaccination rates, and that is not an arbitrary number. 
Essentially, it's a mathematical decision for herd humidity based on the likely R0 of delta, which is between 6 and 8. So herd humidity for delta is going to be around 85-ish percent. Uh, now, our vaccine aren't 100% aren't effective, so you have to back out that a little bit. Uh, however, there's probably is some natural immunity from having been infected. The problem is it's not very reliable. So yes, getting coronavirus does give you some immunity afterwards, but it's not reliable and you tend to get reinfected. I would consider uh, having had coronavirus uh, to be equal to about one shot. So if you've had coronavirus, you still need your, your one or two shots uh, depending on their vaccine after you're using after that. Also keep in mind herd humidity is based on all people not just all eligible and too, too many policy people like to cite the all eligible which is not the number we should be using and it needs to be equally distributed in the population to be effective. So if you look at Lincoln Lancaster County 73 percent that's the wrong metric over in the left upper because that's only people above 16 eligible. It needs to be of all 85 percent and each of these subgroups and you'll notice that there's not a subgroup for less than 11 so because that's zero for the most part for kids under 11 so we need all these subgroups to also be 85 percent uh, to be safe and, and to say you know look, we're really past this thing um, pediatric vaccines, when are they going to come out? Uh, another great uh, update uh, a few days ago from Caitlin Jetalina uh, kind of walks through the time process. So the good news is Pfizer has the phase two, three data out on uh, kids age five to 11. It's looking good. Uh, the, hopefully there's a, it'll go through the process and hopefully we'll be having uh, vaccines for kids, kids ages uh, five to 11 uh, by around Halloween sometime is, is best guess anyway. Uh, it's a smaller dose than the adult dose, which is why you have to do studies and you have to figure out what the dose should be on a kid. Uh, and so she walks through it. And I think it's a really good uh, uh, kind of snapshot of how these decisions get made in the right way. Um, boosters for those who need them. We need time for this as well. So I don't think we should be taking masks off until we've had those who are high risk who need those boosters to get them. Uh, last week I talked about this preprint study out of Israel. Well, it's now published. It's out in the New England Journal, so you can read it yourself. Uh, and it's a very well done study. And I think we owe the Israelis a debt for having the, the, the smarts to actually go ahead and go with a third booster and get really good data as they did it to, and to share that data with us. So it's a little bugs me that, that we have to have to get good data from the Israelis and the Brits because we're not collecting it ourselves on our own. So we only have good data in Pfizer because, you know, we're, these, that's what they use. And so they've got the data on it. Um, UK went ahead and said we're going to uh, give boosters for everybody over 50. Um, uh, Israelis started at 60, they're moving down. Uh, we'll see what the FDA, the FDA panel, people forget uh, last week the decision for FDA isn't, they didn't decide that, they sh that we shouldn't, uh, they said we didn't have enough data at this point, which is honest, we just don't have enough data. Uh, but we'll see in the next week, I think there'll probably be a recommendation uh, for people over 65, healthcare workers, maybe even less. Um, I would argue for uh, boosters for, uh, for 50 and above, honestly, just look at our own local data. So you see those breakthroughs that end up in the hospital. Now, none of them are in the ICU, uh, but still, there are uh, who wants to be in the hospital they don't have to. But it looks like all of our uh, breakthroughs for hospitalizations are 50 and above. So personally, I would go with 50 and above uh, based on the Pfizer data and what we're seeing here. Um, and again, this is one of those 40-70 power rule. You can't, you don't want to make a decision too soon before you don't have, have enough information, but you also want to wait too late uh, because uh, this is an emergency situation and people are dying and getting hospitalized. I think we have enough information to go ahead, but of course I don't run things, so we'll have to wait and see what the, the official folks say here in the, in the coming days. Um, you know, I think you can can use some good data. So, for example, the the CDC article I talked about last week, looking at hospitalization prevention, Moderna was at 95 percent, Pfizer was at 80, and Janssen at 60 percent. Uh, that can helpfully guide your decision making a little bit. Again, Caitlin Gentilina putting out a really good summary of Johnson and Johnson about what we know and what we don't know. And the bottom line, I like, uh, you know, I think it's always fair to say, what would you do if it was you? And she comes out right and says, this is what I would do if it was her. She says, if it was her, uh, I'd get an mRNA vaccine, but, but I'm not you. And so you need to use this to help you make an informed decision. You might want to talk about it with your own doctor, about your own health risks. Uh, you know, how old are you? What health risks? What is your occupation? Uh, but make that decision based uh, partly on you, but because but, I'm not you. Uh, so what might you do? You know, Moderna with that 95%, well, maybe there's, if you had Moderna, maybe there's no reason to rush. Maybe you wait a few uh, weeks and kind of see what data comes out. Uh, I actually did have Moderna and I actually did get my vaccine third uh, 12 days ago. Maybe I jumped the gun because the, uh, the, the booster might just be a 50 microgram dose and have lower side effects than the 100 microgram. Uh, but I went ahead and did it. And uh, so again, that was me based on my own situation. Uh, if you're a Pfizer uh, with that 80% and that backstory, well, likely the official recommendation will come in, be coming out within days. The question is at age 50 versus 60 versus 65 healthcare workers. I uh, will have some more on that, but uh, use that to guide your decision. And Johnson Johnson, well, it, it's up to you. Uh, if, if I had Johnson 
Johnson Johnson as a 50 something year old male uh, with no health conditions but uh, working where I work and doing what I do I'd probably go ahead and get an MRI vaccine but but I'm me uh, also talked about some safety things I shared this visual but the and the this study has also been released uh, so it was also in the New England Journal so I've got the link link to this they had another visualization which I think is also very helpful uh, by putting these sort of bar charts it kind of gives you some uh, better idea of sort of risk comparison uh, essentially here you know orange is uh, is the risk is is higher of getting coronavirus and blue is the risk based on getting the shot and you'll see almost everything the risk of coronavirus itself is wor much worse than the shot uh, the only thing that, that's significant lymphat getting lymphadenopathy that's a swollen lymph node that's not a big deal so i wouldn't worry about that one a herpes zoster infection a slight ri higher risk for the covid but not huge you'll notice the big orange bars for things like kidney injuries, heart heart attacks, uh, strokes, pulmonary embolism, these are pretty big risks. Uh, and so again, I think it's pretty getting pretty clear that the, that the uh, vaccine is much safer than getting coronavirus yourself. Um, last, differential masking versus vac in vaccine verification. I think we need to go here, it's, we're too late. I think some people should be able to take off masks sooner than others. It should be based on their vaccine uh, status. And I think we should be verifying vaccines. Everybody place across the world is doing this. Uh, I like the fact that the Biden administration is going to uh, make that one of the requirements for people flying into the country, but other countries are doing the same thing already. Uh, uh, you know, Italy and, and Israel, for example, they may get, uh, they already have a, a system in place such that you don't have to quarantine if you've been vaccinated. Uh, good to see that the Eagles are going to require you to be uh, have a COVID vaccine or negative test for the next week's show in Omaha. And more and more artists are doing this. So actually, I think this is another good decision. So I think we need to make it to the point that people get vaccinated doing the right thing to do things. And the people who don't get vaccinated are not doing anything. They should not be able to do the same things as the rest of us or should at least require them to get a negative test. So again, you know, back to the 40-70 rule. And the thing I keep seeing is I think, you know, honestly, it, it bugs me. People on the, on the, on the, you know, the right wing's perspective tend to make gut decisions and not pay attention to the data. That's been our problem the whole time. On the other hand, people on the left of the spectrum, they're too hesitant, it won't make a decision. And that's been one of our problems. Um, there's a really good op-ed in Washington Post uh, uh, by this uh, physician, Dr. Farzan Navi, essentially saying kind of the same thing, that, you know, hey, it's an emergency decision, might help, won't hurt, worth pursuing. Uh, and I think we waited too long to make the right decisions on masks and some other things, and that's one of the things he comments on. Uh, and we need to sort of use the same logic, and he kind of echoes the Colin Powell logic. On the flip side, he points out that hydroxychloroquine and ivermectin were really more of a won't help, might hurt, don't pursue, and the data is pretty much showing that, that they're causing more harm than good. Uh, but part of the problem, of course, is misinformation. Uh, some examples here just from the past week, there was a really badly uh, produced study. It's preprint, so it's not really full, uh, but anybody can put their preprints out there. And so this group uh, put out this preprint article uh, claiming that the myocarditis in children was worse uh, and then and the hospitalizations were higher, which is, but the science behind the data is really horrible, actually. If you actually read the article yourself, anybody who's, who can, who's good experienced articles will start seeing, seeing red flags within the first couple paragraphs. Uh, there's this uh, uh, doctor who put together, uh, David Gorski, sort of a take, date take down a lot of their methods. I, he calls it dumpster diving in the VAERS database, which is really true. And he kind of goes through the whole strategy of how anti-vaxxers play with the VAERS database and in, in, in sort of dishonest ways. And it's a good read if you want to really see how some of the anti-vaxxers play with this data. And I've seen numerous comments that are very similar. Uh, also Google the people who write this thing. If you actually see who some of these people are, you'll notice that uh, that, that two of the people don't, uh, one of the people doesn't really have any credentials. And if you look at where they work, uh, that should start raising some red flags as well. And, and so kind of so Google who the people are and see if they're actually credible. Uh, a lot of people keep sending me these YouTube videos and they'll say, have you seen this video, YouTube video for the, by this doctor? And I tell them, well, one, Google the doc and see if he or she is legit. Because uh, if they're not legit, don't bother wasting your time and certainly don't forward that YouTube video. You know, are those people gainfully employed? Are they in good standing? Are they held leadership positions? Well, geez, do they have a restraining order? So I got one last week where someone said this, uh, this Peter McCulloch was a good guy, well-regarded in the healthcare system. And the very first hit uh, when I Google him is, uh, Baylor doc gets restraining order against COVID vaccine skeptic doc. Well, if that's this guy, do you really want to waste your time on that YouTube video? And certainly don't forward it. Uh, so make sure these are actually legit people producing these videos, which is why I list at the end of me what I actually do so you can verify what I do and that I've held leadership positions and I do know at least what I'm talking about, at least I hope you think so. Uh, but again, disclaimer, these are my opinions, not of the organizations, but it does help you verify uh, where I'm coming from and what my experience is and that I am in good standing with all the things I'm doing. Uh, so again, hopefully this helps. Uh, I'll probably talk to you next week.